Get Warrior Talk, Mental Training 101 with Andrew Whitman on 105.5 The Roar. Back to Andrew Whitman. All right, we're back. All right, Dutch, when we when we went out to break, we're talking about getting the best performance in that. The coaches, uh, this used to be the norm, was bullying because we had lots of power. We just use it for what we call it bullying now. But the research says that's not the best way to get out of your people. But the best way is to uh, create belief that the coach believes in their people. And I, and I got to tell you, the mentors and the coaches that I've had, and, and Lieutenant Colonel John Pelchetti has been on the show a couple times. I got to get him back on. But he believed in me. Uh, and took me from this surf punk, you know, 19-year-old corporal and turned me into, you know, a hard-charging, you know, sergeant um, and leader of Marines in combat. So what do you think about that whole statement right there, Dutch, instead of bullying? Well, I, I just, I, I think the, the word bullying says enough right there. You know, bullying is, a, is such a one-way relationship. Picture a bully. The bully says everything in the, in the, in the, the bullied just does whatever the bully says. So yeah. there, there's no input from the person being bullied. I, I, it takes me uh, back to relationships because people think back then was so much better with respect to this. When you can yell and, and when I was growing up, my coach yelled and I just did what I said. Well, yeah, well, so did I. But, you know, there was a better way. If I had a marriage and you think of a marriage is back in the 40s and 50s, you know, oh, man, the good old days, man. You know what happened in the good old days a lot of times? Uh, it wasn't as great as as the wives back then. It wasn't always as great when you dig down deep inside and see what was going on because you had the husband telling the wife everything to do. She had no input in anything. He just told her what to do. She did it and she was happy about it. Well, the truth is she probably wasn't happy about it. Right. When you fast forward to today where relationships are much more open and there's talking involved when they have some input. Now, I know how to make my, my wife happy because I asked her what she liked. Hey, what movie would you like to see? What would you like to do? Or, hey, do you like this or do you like that? Well, I got news for you. It wasn't like that back then. I told her what was going on, what was going to happen, the way it was going to be, and that was the end of it. And that's the, that's the that relationship is paralleled in athletics. I told you how it was going to be. Now you got more coaches saying, hey, what do you think? What's going on? What do you see out there? What's going on? And coaches are better for it. Right. When these kids feel they, 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 they're, they're buying into it, because the coach is making them feel a part of the solution, a part of the, the team, a part of the uh, the direction of the ship. And you're getting more out of these kids nowadays than they ever did, even though it seems uh, uh, like like it was a golden age back then where you could just yell and scream and people did whatever you said. Right. And there's science that backs this up. This is what happens in the brain. So the brain, it says, is a work in progress, constantly shaped by the experiences around us. Okay. Adversity and stress can impair neurogenesis, the process by which the ever-evolving brain produces new cells. So there's some evidence that suggests that stress impairs the circuitry that regulates negative emotions in particular. So abuse can have this very pernicious effect, which can have a spiraling effect and lead to an increase in negative emotions as a consequence. So you get them on this train, and it's a downward spiral, and all it does is it completely shuts off the creative problem solving half of your brain or the part that when we say, Hey, what is it that you see out there? How would you do it? How could we do it? And, you know, I got to tell you, this is, um, you know, I witnessed this, um, with it at the high school level. And there's some coach going off on his, these kids in there telling them that they, if they're, you know, basically if your arm's broken, just, you know, rub some dirt on it and get back in there. You know, you don't need medical attention. I went to him afterwards like, Hey dude, you know what? Um, I'm just going to tell you right now. Um, if I ever hear you saying that again, we're going to go talk to the AD and the principal and we're going to talk to the superintendent of the school district because that's just stupid, you know, to tell kids at this age to just go rub some dirt on. I mean, you know, just keep, you know, play injured, not hurt, injured. You know, if your shoulder needs surgery, wait till after the season. Now, that's just stupid. Right. At that level and really at any level. The only time I would tell anybody to do that is if our life's in danger. Like, we're on a mission, and I, we, hey, I'm shot. Great, we're all shot. Can you fight? You know, what was that, that was that line from that movie? Right. You know, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you brought the military experience into that because, you know, a lot of people say, oh, man, our soldiers are dealing with this and that every day. And, and yeah, yeah, they are. They're, they're the best of the best. And they've been trained to do that, and they're doing that at a much higher cause, causality uh, level of, 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 of impact of of, of you know, the things that could happen if they don't. And and that's why we love those guys and gals so much is because they have decided to do that for us and sacrifice, make that sacrifice. But sports is not that serious. 
So that's where you have these people talking out of both sides of their mouths. Right. Sports is not that serious. These these guys are elite. These guys are just here to entertain us. <laughs> so we have to keep things in perspective. And as leaders, we have to understand that. And and I'll say one more thing about the word abuse. Andrew, that sounds like a very harsh term to use in this abuse, right? But it doesn't make it not true. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Oh, I do, so, man. So even though we're using a word that people don't want to hear, people don't want to hear words like abuse when it comes to yelling and stuff like that. But it is what it is. So you can call it whatever you want, but it doesn't change those studies. That's the information that's in those studies. It doesn't change the lives that we're losing because if we lose one life over something like this, that's one life too many. And it's happening. Regardless of what we want to call it, it's happening. Right. And uh, and again, it's not just yelling. Okay, so there's one story in here that they're talking about. It was women's basketball. And uh, the coach, this was a starter that now is hurt, like injured, can't play. As long as you're producing and you're a starter, then we're good to go. There's no issues with my performance. Then we come in and she says, well, here's the definition of sheepish. Sheepish is you should, you you know, here's what it is. And now you're a sheep and you cannot talk and you can't even talk in this session. And you can't talk for the rest of the year. You cannot open your mouth and say one word. So, are, well, why don't you just like kick him off the team then? Because that's ridiculous to say that you can you're going to have to be here, but you can't have say one word. You can't open your mouth. And these are the these are the leaders. These are the adults that are that are supposed to be taking our our young people to the next level. And I think a lot of times they're trying to get those kids to quit. That's what they're trying to do because then it takes the pressure off them. It it, it takes you know it takes the ball out of their court and say, well, that kid quit. Right, and, so and, they don't have and, to make the hard shameful. decision to say, I'm taking your scholarship away or whatever. We'll say, hey, they quit, and it opens up a... And that was kind of what they said at the end of the article. They said, you know, paradoxically and perversely, you know, they're, they're only going to have one tool left, make life so miserable for the unwanted athletes that they leave on their own accord. And and what you're saying is they're probably already there. They're already trying yeah. to do that. And, and if you look at it, a lot of times, it's a failure of the leaders from the start that they have to take those steps. Because it was your failure to maybe recruit the athletes that were needed. And now you feel like you have to do this this purging because you didn't do a good job on the front end anyway. So now I got to make the athletes pay for it. Mm. Well, you, you brought me here to play. You wow. realize I wasn't as good as you thought I was. Now you want to boot me off because of your your inability to recognize talent. Hey, don't blame me for stinking. <laughs> right. And And, you know, in this article, it says that like you were talking about the good old days and it worked fine. And, you know, he says that our conviction that hostility works is encouraged by a culture that makes legendary figures like Bobby Knight and Steve Jobs. Um, and there, he quotes this guy named Tepper and that's out of Ohio State, and his office is right by the stadium. And he says uh, Tepper believes that both uh, of these guys succeeded in spite of their abusive leadership. The Knight was very tactically smart, and Jobs had a rare combination of design sense and business acumen. And the studies say that there's no incremental benefit to being hostile, even when you can, even when you control for a leader's experience and expertise. Hostility always produces a diminishing return. And you know what? I see it with high school kids. And their coaches at that level, I see it with high school kids and teachers at that level, and then I take it all the way up to Fortune 500s, and I work with the federal government, I work with law enforcement, I work with spec ops guys. See, spec ops guys, they don't have, you know, hostility is always focused outward, not inward. That inside wow. the team, it's not focused inside, and that doesn't mean we always get along, but we're not, that hostility is always finds another outlet, a bigger enemy. And so, and this should carry over into sports. There's a bigger enemy. The enemy shouldn't be in here. It's whoever we're playing next Saturday, man. You know, the, the sad part about the whole Bob Knight thing, because I have, I've, I've, I've studied that extensively. Bob Knight has had a lot of ex, uh, uh, successful student athletes that came through his program, and I mean successful in life. Yeah. That doesn't mean their emotional health is there. <laughs> right. And, 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 you know, a lot of those guys, they bottle that stuff up in because Probably they not. will admit to this day that they were abused, but they will always come with the caveat that, but that's the way it's supposed to be or that's the way it was because they're brainwashed to think that's okay, just like a, 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 a victim of abuse does. Right. You almost have to do that in order to, to survive it. You almost have to. It's like the Stockholm Syndrome that, you know, hostages go through. They, um, they start siding with the, the hostage taker. Exactly. Exactly. And what and what ends up happening is they're really a powder keg that can go at any moment. And as you said in your percentage, I think it was the six percent. You know, we don't need even one going because it's right. just not worth it. 
it's not worth it. So you're talking about high school athletes and college athletes who are putting this powder keg and they're and they're burying it all deep down inside. And they may survive and they may be emotionally handicapped the rest of their lives. They're not hugging their kids. They're not. They're very stern. They're, they're, they're un, very unemotional people. But the but the the, the percentage that can't handle it, they end up shooting up the workplace, right. hurting themselves, hurting others. It's not worth it for the activity that they're doing. They aren't going into combat. They aren't saving the world. They aren't protecting a nation. They're playing a collegiate sport or a high school sport. Right. It's not worth it. And then, then what happens is that it, it, it kind of perpetuates the next generation. That's how I was coached. So now I'm going to be a little league coach or a high school coach, you know, and that's so all that I'm just going to carry that on. Cause this is the only thing that I know. Interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. He, he, this goes on to say, we have a finite amount of energy. You're concerned with whether your coach will yell at you rather than doing your job. So it impairs your executive function. So, and again, instead of being focused on the enemy and doing your job and executing what we have to do to beat the team, I'm worried about I'm going to be in trouble with the coach. Yeah, and, and, and that's just ridiculous. So I'm splitting the two things here, and my brain can't do two things well at once. We can't multitask. You have to focus on one thing at a time. And, it, and, and this happens with law enforcement too, man. We're all, guys always second guess, you know, am I going to get sued, you know, and it, and it puts them in a bad spot. Um, because of the way the can and I know both sides of the law enforcement thing, but there, there's a lot of that. I was always kind of, you know, hey man, you know what? You got to get that out of the back of your mind. If I'm going home at the end of the shift, kind of deal, you know. And it's the same thing, you know, when I'm dealing with State Department guys. We're thinking about man, you know, you got to get that out of your mind and deal with the consequences of your action. But you can't be second guessing yourself while you're on the field, and that's what we're seeing here with this. That you, if you're so worried about, you know, there's hostility coming from the coach, you're not going to perform on the field. And that's why the training or the coaching part of it is so important, because when you go into that moment when you need it, you're not second guessing it. And that's why that training and coaching is so important so that you become almost an expert at whatever it is so that there is no second guessing, even in the law enforcement. Uh, you know, you have some people. That's why you can't have second class people out there in the field. Right. You got to have first class people out there in that field because they've gone through the training physically mentally yep. emotionally so many times that when they get out there they're not second guessing it and they're trusting that they're making a, the right decision the right, right choice whether they have to use that firearm or not and when they do most of the time the vast majority of the time it is the right decision because they were focused and they were locked in on that training that emotional training the physical training the mental training everything and they did trust their their training and they made the right choice right and i'll just say that dutch and i we are bringing this into law enforcement um you know, at the beginning of next year, we're rolling out with uh, we're in front of, you know, police unions and police chiefs. And then and we're, we're rolling this out because they need it out in the field as well. Um, but you could get it right now. So, you know, get on the jump. Right. <laughs> Call the office. 864-977-1443. Dutch, the last thing before we go, the hour is gone. But I wanted to quote this guy, Tepper. His office sits steps from the Ohio Stadium. And where the Buckeyes football team coaches, he says, raise their voices at practice. There's a lot of yelling, but he hasn't heard anything that alarms him. There's a lot of yelling, but it's more exhortative and attention-getting, not degrading. And this is totally fine, and you could teach it to people. Amen. Amen. Nothing wrong, wrong, wrong with a little yelling. I yell all the time at my guys, and, uh, and they love me for it because what I'm yelling, it, 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 it basically takes over. The fact that I am yelling. What I'm yelling takes over the fact that I'm yelling. All right, buddy. The hour's gone. I'll see you next week. Yes, sir. Thanks, Dutch.